Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone. I hope you're all well. Today, for the first time, I've actually decided to do a video on tafsir. And the surah I've chosen is Surah Al-Hadid. So Surah Al-Hadid, it's a Madani surah. And this surah starts with the word Sabbaha. So there are a set of surahs called the Musabbihat surahs. Because these surahs, they start with the word of glorification. Sabbaha means to glorify. And a common theme in all of these Musabbihat surahs is that somewhere, you know, in these surahs, there is some sort of a blame, some sort of a reprimand to the believers. And Allah Ta'ala is telling the believers, you better fix this problem. So, um, what are the believers being reprimanded in this surah? Um, I'll tell you later on. We'll get uh, there, inshallah. Uh, let's start the surah. Now, a lot of these surahs, they will always start with an introduction. It's quite common for any surah to start with, the introduction, with an introduction. And the introduction of this surah is in the first six ayat. In the first uh, six verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about, you know, His attributes, His names. Okay, so before I start, I just do want to point out I don't have a translation in front of me, and so please, I'm not doing a word to word translation, okay? Uh, so, the first ayah of this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just saying that everything in the heavens and earth glorifies Him. He is Almighty, all wise. Now, it's very important to understand whichever attributes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, they're always connected with the whole ayah. And also, these attributes are not just connected with that ayah but they are actually connected to the main theme of the surah i'll get to that in more details later on as well but here simply allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that everything in the heavens and earth every single thing glorifies him so allah is saying to the believers if everything glorifies him and all of these things these mountains and everything they've been created for us so if they are glorifying allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shouldn't we be glorifying him and he's saying that even if you think that you are glorifying me, but there is something missing. There's something wrong. So, for example, glorification is not just done with the tongue. It's not just to say Subhanallah. Glorification comes from the heart. You know, you go and you see the beauty of this world, and and you and you just glorify Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for the beautiful things that He's created. Glorification is also with the limbs. So, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us to do something, we actually do it as He told us. So, in this case, you know, it's going to be about spending. But you know. I'll talk about that later on. And then these attributes are continuing to ayah number two. So in second ayah, Allah is saying that everything, He has the full ownership, the full authority of everything that's in the heavens and the earth. So every single thing belongs to Him. There's no competition for Him. And He is the one who gives life and He is the one who gives death. And then Allah ends this ayah saying, He is all able over everything. He's Al-Qadir. So He has full qudra, you know, full power. He's able to do whatever He wants because He's the owner. He's the sole owner of the world, of the heavens and the earth. But then moving on to the third ayah, in this ayah, you know, this hadith where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said um, that this ayah is actually better than a thousand verses. So basically, there's a lot of emphasis on the importance of this ayah, how important this ayah is. And pay attention because this ayah is very important, okay? So in this ayah, Allah is saying, He is Al-Awwal and He is Al-Akhir. Al-Awwal, He is pre-eternal. He existed when nothing existed. He is Al-Akhir, infinite. The whole world will end, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always going to be there. He is wal-zahir wal -batin. He is wal-zahir, apparent. He knows everything that happens apparently, and he has all knowledge of everything that's hidden. Wahua bikulli shayin alim, and he knows everything. In the introduction of this surah, when we are focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qualities, his names, his attributes, there's so much emphasis on his knowledge that Allah ta'ala is saying he knows everything. The apparent and the hidden, everything that's going in your mind, everything that's going in your heart, he has knowledge of every single thing. And why is there so much emphasis on knowledge? There's a reason, okay? And then he continues. Now, he, you know, he has already told us he's created the heavens and the earth. He has full authority over them. And now he goes into more details in ayah number four. Then he says that he created these heavens and earth in six days. Just He's just going into more details. He's established himself on the throne. And then he says he knows everything that enters in the ground, enters the earth, and everything that exits from the earth. You know, things that enter the earth. It's, it's again, it's kind of hidden. We don't know it. But he knows everything enters everything that enters the earth everything that exits the earth he knows everything that ascends from the heavens and descends to the heavens every morning every evening our deeds are taken to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he has full knowledge of everything apparent everything hidden everywhere 
And then he says, he's with you wherever you are. So, you know, we might think we're hiding from everyone. We can do whatever we want. And Allah said, well, you can't hide from me. Wallahu bima ta'amaloon basir. And he sees everything you do. So even when you think you're hiding and no one sees you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. And moving on to ayah number five, it's, it's a continuation of his attributes. He is saying again, it, he's emphasizing again on, you know, his kingship, his ownership of the heavens and earth and everything's going to return to him. And moving on to ayah number Number six, he says that he makes the night enter into the day and the day enter into the night. And uh, he knows everything. He knows what's in the hearts. Again, here it's important to uh, focus on the night and the day. Night is what's dark. So a lot of crimes, when do they happen? In the dark, when no one sees you. So again, he's emphasizing here on everything hidden and everything apparent. So that was our introduction. And the introduction focuses a lot on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. He knows everything hidden and secret. And he keeps on talking about this apparent and, you know, hidden through different, different examples, through night and day, to what goes in the earth and comes out, comes down the heavens and goes up, you know, in different ways. Why so much emphasis on the attribute of his knowledge? Now, the reason is because we need to understand who are the addressees in this surah. The main addressees in this surah are the believers and the hypocrites. So the believers are parent in the iman. The hypocrites, they are hiding the real iman they have. They're pretending to be Muslims, but inside it's something else happening. So Allah is saying to the believers, everything you are doing is apparent to me. And to the hypocrites, Allah SWT is saying, whatever is going through your heart and your mind, He knows everything. You can't hide from Him anything. So the emphasis on His knowledge, on everything being hidden and secret, and Him knowing everything, is because it's connected to the addressees in this surah. Now, why are these two being addressed? the believers and the hypocrites because the main theme of this surah it's on spending so before i move on to ayah number seven i want to explain to you the context of this surah so first of all, it's a madani surah I, it was revealed uh, after hijra that's what madani surah means it's been revealed after hijra now, so what's happening that time period obviously there are battles happening and for that you need resources so rasulullah he's obviously asking these people to contribute uh, to spend in the course of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for some people who you know they might be old and they can't fight but they have the resources so he's saying spend your resources and you know provide for those who can go and fight but they don't have the resources so a lot of young men they're brave and they want to go but but they don't have the resources they don't have the camel you know they don't have other things that they need so the main theme of this surah it's about spending in the cause of allah and here more specifically the cause was you know uh, fighting but the beauty of the Qur'an is that it's not limited to the context. So Allah Ta'ala doesn't restrict it saying spend, you know, in, in fighting. He keeps it very general. He just says, anfiqu. Anfiqu means to spend. So the fact, the wording, it's so general, it means for us lot now, it's going to be a very general meaning of spending in the cause of Allah, spending in the path of Allah. And that means charity, helping the poor and needy, helping establish masajid, you know, helping the Islamic institutes, you know, especially in Western countries, we need to support the Islamic education system here, you know, uh, sponsoring an orphan child. So this entire surah, you will actually realize there's a lot of that ghib happening there's so much persuasion where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is persuading us to spend in his cause to spend in charity so let's move on to ayah number seven so in ayah number seven Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying aminu billahi believe in Allah and his rasul so he's saying believe in Allah and his rasul and then he's saying and spend from what Allah has made you a trustee over it so he's first of all in this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already connected spending with iman so he's connecting our actions and our iman together. You can't have iman say, I believe in Allah and not obey him. Actions have to be in line with your iman. And then he's saying, you know, the wealth you have, it's you, you're just a trustee over it. It was someone else's before and then you inherited it. So, you know, it's not going to be yours forever. You're going to die and someone else will just inherit it. So whilst you have it, whilst you're a trustee over it and you're looking after it, do the right thing with it spend it in the right cause so moving on to ayah number eight he actually asked a question to the addressees that's us and that time the believers and the hypocrites of that time and the whole idea of asking a question is to make you think for yourself as well so what's the question he's asking he's saying what's wrong with you why don't you believe in Allah and Rasul he's calling you to believe in your Lord and indeed you've already given a covenant as well 
if you are believers. So who's Allah SWT asking these questions? To the hypocrites, because they're pretending to be believers and Allah is saying, what's wrong with you though? Why can you not really believe sincerely in Allah and Rasul? He's, he's asking them questions to start making them think for themselves. Why can they not just do that? And then Allah moves on to ayah number 9 and he confirms the prophethood of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He confirms he is the one who sent revelation to Rasulullah. He says that he is the one. He sent clear proofs on his slave, on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he gives a reason for these clear proofs, why he sent them to him. He says these clear proofs, the revelation, the Quran, that's what the clear proof is. This clear proof, the reason he sent this to you is so to take you out from darkness to light. So remember again the theme of this surah is to spend. So when you're spending, that's light. When you're being stingy and you're holding that wealth, that's darkness. Iman in Allah and Rasul following Rasulullah, that's light. You don't follow Rasulullah, that's darkness. You have a connection with the Quran, you understand the Quran, that's light. You abandon the Quran, that's darkness. So saying he, he's all compassionate, he's all merciful. And moving on to the next ayah, ayah number 10. Again, another question, you know, just to make you think. The whole point of asking some a question, a direct question to you, is so you can think for yourself. Allah is saying, what's wrong with you? Why can you not spend in his path? So you should start thinking, you know, well, why am I being so greedy? Why am I just, you know, not spending in Allah's path? Why am I not giving charity? And Allah is saying, you know, he doesn't really need your charity. You know, everything. The entire inheritance, the entire earth, the moon, the sun, the heavens and earth, everything really belongs to him. He doesn't really need you to spend on him. He's, you're not really doing him a favor. It's actually going to benefit us. That's what he's telling us. And then he says, you know, those who spend from you before the fat and after fat, they're not equal. So fat here can be the conquest of Makkah or it can be Hudaybiyah. So Allah is saying, but you know what? You both will get reward. So he's clearly saying that those people who do good deeds they all will get reward but it's not going to be the same because those who spent before fat you know at that time there were few muslims there was so much more they had to spend the resources were very limited and as for now so many more muslims have entered you know more people are making contributions so resources have increased so the contribution you need to make now it's, it's very limited so you know you still get a reward for it but don't compare yourself to those senior sahabas who really spent a lot and then Allah ends this ayat, Wallahu bima ta'amaluna khabir. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows everything you do. So He knows your intentions. So your reward is not just about the action, you know, it's also about the intention. And He's going to reward you, you know, based on your intention as well. Next ayah, ayah number 11, ends with, Whoever gives a loan to Allah, a goodly loan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to double it. It's going to multiply it and you'll have so much reward for it. This ayah, Allah ta'ala is clearly telling us, He's asking you for a loan, yeah? What's a loan? When you give someone, they're going to give it back to you. You'll get it in return. So Allah is saying, when you spend in his cause, you're not making no loss. You'll actually get it back. But you won't even get it back the same. It's going to be multiplied. He can double it. He can multiply it. He can, he's going to give you more in return. So don't think you've made a loss. There's too much profit in there for you. So from verses 7 to verses 11, it's all about encouraging uh, the believers to spend now when talking about the addressees you know there's actually a bit of a spectrum here and things quite important to understand so we have at this end you know sincere muslims who would do anything you know they would just give all their wealth they would sacrifice themselves they would do anything the complete opposite end of these sincere Muslims would be like the leaders of the hypocrites, like Abdul ibn Sulu, like those kind of leaders and then in the middle you'll have new muslims you know they are like they really believe but they're a bit weak in iman so you know if they find it hard to spend or you'll have those weak hypocrites they might spend out of you know to show the muslims we're true but but they doubt their faith so you kind of have a spectrum of you know the addressees here like very sincere believers really horrible hypocrites and then those in the middle so there's a lot of persuasion happening in this surah encouraging all of these people to spend at very different levels and that's the beauty of the quran quran is for everyone okay it's not just for the strongest muslim or you know the kafir or the worst hypocrite it's for many of us who kind of fall in the middle you know sometimes we're really sincere in iman but we might be a bit stingy and all that saying no don't be stingy you need to spend in his cause you need to spend in charity so he's encouraging us so you must have realized when i'm actually doing my tafsir i actually divide the surahs into passages 
uh, and I try to understand each passage because if you just do one eye at a time, it just gets difficult sometimes to see how it's connected with the next ayah or how it's connected to the next passage or how it's all kind of connected to the whole surah uh, because there's a unity in the whole surah, you know, th there's connections. We can find in all different passages. So it's just, I find it easier when I divide the surah into smaller passages. So yes, 1 to 6 was the introduction, then 7 to 11 was just a lot of persuasion on spending, kind of setting the theme of this surah this, that it's all about spending in Allah's cause. And moving on to ayah number 12. From ayah number 12 to ayah number 15, there's a conversation happening between the believers and the hypocrites on the day of judgment. So in ayah number 12, Allah SWT says, you will see the believing men and the believing women, you know, there'll be nur in front of them and nur on their right side and glad tidings to you that day of Jannah rivers flowing beneath it you know residing there residing therein forever and that is a great achievement so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here very specifically mentions believing men and believing women you know he can just say believers because usually throughout the Quran he just says believers and when he says believers both men and women are included in it but here he signals out especially the believing men and the believing women and it's going to do this throughout this page uh, to different types of people, believing men and believing women. Why does he do that? Why does he signal them out? Because he's grabbing their attention here that both of you, you men and you women, you both will individually have your reward for your good deeds. So as we said, the theme of this surah is spending. So he's encouraging them both that you both be charitable, spend in this course and you will have your own individual rewards in the hereafter. And what's the reward here in this ayah for the believing men and the women? He mentions two rewards as well. One is nur. So, so remember in the hereafter when we are going when we are going to cross the bridge of Asirat, we are going to need a nur that time. We are going to need that light at that time because that light is going to show us the way and we're going to quickly cross the bridge. And the next reward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, once you've crossed the bridge, you know, you've got your nur and you've crossed the bridge, then the next thing in front of you is going to be Jannah and you'll be in Jannah forever, relaxing there all happily ever after. And moving on to ayah number 13 and then says that day the munafiqun the hypocrite men and the munafiqat and the hypocrite women they will say to the believers so remember before Allah Ta'ala mentioned mu'minin and mu'minat believing men and believing women now in this ayah he mentions uh, munafiqun and munafiqat hypocrite men and hypocrite women he's again signaling out them both separately so he's he's calling them both separately you men and you women both of you reprimanding them both here and what is he saying they are going to say to the believers you know d just wait let us have a bit of your nur as well you know why can you not just share your nur with us basically saying and then they'll be told go back go and get your own nur so that's what believers will say go get your own nur and then Allah says there's going to be a wall between the believers and the hypocrites and f and inside the wall there's going to be rahmah it's going to be for the believers and outside the wall there's going to be punishment obviously for the hypocrites and then in ayah number 14 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the hypocrites they're going to reply back to the believers they're going to say to them hey we were with you in this dunya so you know in dunya we did everything together why can you not just share your nur with us now basically and then the believers will respond to them no you put yourself in a place of fitna you never really had iman you was always like oh, waiting for us to kind of you know get in trouble you wanted us to lose a battle and you know for us to get destroyed um, you doubted and you know your false hopes they just deluded you until the command of Allah came and the deceiver deceived you. So basically then the believers will say to these hypocrites, you just used to pretend all along. You never had no sincere man. You never really believed. Yet you wanted us to lose. So, you know, uh, so how can you basically demand now that you want to share Noor with us? So basically in dunya, when it was time to give charity, you never want to give no charity. When it was time to strengthen you know, our forces, you did not want to make any contribution. You did not want to give any resources. You did not want to be a part of it. And now you want the reward for it. For what? No reward for you. We're not going to share our nur with you today. And then in ayah number 15, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that no fidya is going to be taken from you today, no ransom. So ransom is what? You give money or something, you, whatever you give to release yourself. And so I was saying, when it was the time to spend, when you was told to spend in charity, you didn't want to spend then, and now to save yourself, you're willing to give everything, there's no need. 
it's too late for it you know there's time for everything when you don't do things on time it's just too late you're not going to get no reward for it now it's too late you cannot save yourself and then Allah says and nor for the disbelievers so now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comparing these hypocrites their situation to the same situation of the disbelievers because disbelievers at least they apparently said we don't believe the hypocrites are really pretending to believe but their actions are just like the kuffar so the end result is going to be the same so the whole purpose of this scene of the day of judgment and the conversation between the hypocrites and the believers again its purpose is to really like you know persuade people to you know spend in the cause of Allah and it's to you know when you show them these scenarios you know where you're going to be in trouble and there's this punishment and you won't be able to save it's all dissuasion happening like you don't want to be in that state save yourself from being in that situation take the right action now and then we move on to ayah number 16 and 17 and in ayah number 16 and 17 it's it's kind of all about like having a soft heart that's what the focus is in these two ayat so in ayah number 16 Allah Ta'ala says to the believers you know when will your hearts become humble to the dhikrillah to the remembrance of Allah so it's really talking to the believers here and remember when I gave the spectrum so there's those really sincere believers but then there's lots of weak believers who are new so so I thought he's saying to these believers your hearts really need to become humble to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like when Allah ta'ala orders you to do something just do it be humble and uh, it is actually said that these two ayat are actually Makki verses okay ayat number 16 and 17 and Allah is saying to these believers don't be like the Ahlul Kitab don't be like the people of the book they were given revelation they were given book just how you have been given revelation you have been given the haqq the truth and what happened to these people they didn't follow it you know they did not follow the ahkams of Allah they didn't really obey and when a long time passes by and you kind of belittle whatever is revealed to you in the scriptures when long time passes by you don't pay heed to the revelation what happens your hearts have become hard and just become so much easier for people to commit sins and just do evil when your hearts are hard so Allah is saying take action quickly you know if you're going to delay and not listen to what Allah Ta'ala tells you in the Quran now you're going to become like these people you don't want to have hard hearts so soft heart will actually lead to charity so having a soft heart it's very important and then in ayah number 17, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who gives life to the earth after it was dead. And indeed, we have clarified to you uh, the ayat, the signs, so you may have aql, so you may think. Allah is saying the earth, it was dead. There was nothing on it and He gave life. Similarly, you people, you know, you used to be mushriks. That's a dead heart. And He gave you life. He revived your hearts. So, you know, make sure you have soft hearts now. Don't let them become hard anymore. You don't want to go back to you know how your ancestors were and that's what he's encouraging us as well and he's saying once he's brought us close to deen many of us we're so lucky we actually born in a muslim environment you know so it should be easier for us to have soft hearts but it's not for many so although he's saying you know once you've got this gift of iman you know really uphold it and act upon it and you know be humble so I number 17 and 18 they emphasize on a soft heart and then moving on to i number 18 and 19 so people with soft heart what other qualities do they have they have the quality of charity so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says indeed the musaddiqeen the, the men again he's going to mention the men and women separately the men who give charity and the women who give charity and they give a goodly loan for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah is going to double it he's going to multiply he's going to give them so much reward so again Allah is mentioning men separately and women separately and again you know he's emphasizing that for each of you it's your deeds and your own reward and he's really persuading each one of us to take action to give in charity and then I number 19 he's saying those who believe in Allah and Rasul remember he's already said before for believing Allah and Rasul and giving charity he linked a faith and action together so now again he's saying those who believe in Allah and his Rasul they are the truthful people they are the truthful people and they are the shuhada so remember here the context was actually jihad so the shuhada uh, it has two meanings someone who, who's a witness and someone who's a martyr so in this context it's going to be martyrs so here the meaning is going to be of martyr because it's just more in line with the context so they're saying and for the martyrs their reward is it's nur in this the first half of this ayah he's praised the truthful people and the martyrs 
And the second half of the same ayah, he says those who disbelieve and those who deny, they are the dwellers of hellfire. So, so another Quranic style is contrast, where you clearly mention reward for one thing and then straight after clearly you mention the punishment for something. So the good is clear and the bad is clear and you don't have any doubt, oh my God, am I on the right side or am I on the wrong side? So that's what contrast does. It just makes it very clear. This is good and this is bad. The choice, it's yours now. What do you want to do? You want to follow the right path or you want to follow the wrong path? Do you want reward in the hereafter or do you want punishment in the hereafter? Okay, sorry guys, if it is getting very long and I need to go. Uh, inshallah, I'll try to finish it off later on, inshallah, okay? Take a cycle.